as I walked in this morning, um, unbelievably, I saw my very own senior pastor, uh, the former associate national overseer in North America. And as I took my seat, I also saw our beloved Dickiness sitting here. Shall we just give a round of applause to the Lord? And just let's rise up to our feet in honor of them to welcome them as a yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome, man. You're welcome, man. Let's be seated. If you notice, I do have a part here with me to look at and and speak to the house. It's basically because I'm not preaching to the house. I'm only <laughs> delivering. No, no, I know. It's not what you're all thinking. We're not having a conversation today. I am delivering a message. If Brother Olalu Day it's a very, very young man. If you are here, please listen carefully. Brother Mene, Brother Omaye, Sister Tene Rufai, our little sister Adejola, Sister Shalom, Brother Orwell, all of our children, I mentioned a few names because those are a few names that I can remember out of a very, very long list of people who have come here to stand on this pulpit to minister. All of our children, the Council of Ministers, fellow members of this great house, Many, many decades ago, looking back to what we believe now, the Lord gave a vision of this mission to a certain individual. And one of them is still ever living with us today in a very own person, a very own Reverend Dr. Elijah Oludele Abino. The man whom we all reverence as a father among us, among many fathers. And so what I'm giving to you or what I'm here to read and to deliver to you, they are not my own vision. And I'm not just standing here to read or to just deliver a message. Let me set it straight. I'm here to cast a vision and I'm here to declare an established prophecy, an established covenant for them, for us in my own generation and for the generations to come. And that's why I mentioned a few names to you so you know that as I stand here today, I'm really, really delivering a message to you, a message of covenant, a message of vision that is given to our fathers, upon whom steps we are following as we all look to the Lord together. And this is on the Successful Christian Life series. Successful Christian Life series. And I can imagine one of the reasons we are doing this is 
what will stand as legacy for our forerunners in this mission and a red legacy that will become perpetual for Gospel Faith Mission International all over the world. We cannot forget it. We cannot deviate from them. We cannot afford to be turned to what many other churches who started under the firebrand of apostles and ministers of our King of Glory. But today, they have become nominal. That's not what Gospel Faith Mission is all about. And that's the reason why I stand here on behalf of our general overseer to deliver the intent of his heart to us all as members of this great mission. We've been on this for quite a while now, on the Successful Christian Living Series. So today, we're going to Series 4, which is the Christian and the local church. That means you and House of Hope, if you are here, you are at a local church. And everywhere all over the globe, where Gospel Faith Mission Assemblies are situated, this is for us. The successful Christian life cannot be lived in isolation. The life of Christ in us must be demonstrated in the community of both believers and unbelievers alike. Sometimes we are deceived into thinking that I'm by myself. I live my own life. I don't bother anyone. I don't mingle with anyone. I don't even ha don't have friends, whether at church or out there. I do my own thing. The reality is we might think so, but it's not truly so. As every human being, we interrelate with our society, whether at church or in the community. Did it ever occur to you that when you are driving on that highway, you are actually driving in relationship to other drivers on that highway? You're not just alone. It's only when we look at commercials, we will see that brand car that is being advertised. If you watch, there are no other cars. It's just that car on that TV ad that you see. But in reality, in everything you do, whether you are in the grocery store or you are at an event, what we do indirectly, whether we like it or not, is in relation to other people. So as a purpose-driven church, our statement of purpose and core values clearly specify the roles and the responsibilities of the believers in the local churches, in the surrounding communities, and the world at large. In the purpose and the core values of this mission, they are a vision that is cast. They represent a covenant, a covenant, and they represent a prophecy by God that is established for this mission. And by the grace of God, it will continue eternally until the Lord comes. Yes, let's shout a bigger amen to that. Amen. The government statement of purpose embraces the basic and the major functions of the church, namely outreach, worship, fellowship, discipleship, service, 
All this, when put into action, make the church effective, make the church active, and get recognized in the community and the world at large. The government statement of purpose stands as her vision to which every member should subscribe and be committed. I want to pause a little bit and I want you to repeat that after me. The government statement of purpose stands at, as her vision to which every member, including me, should subscribe and be committed and vigorously pursue to achieve its aim and objective. And let me add to it, because it is a covenant. It is a covenant. It is a covenant. The statement of purpose is a foundational truth that I want us to continue to perpetuate from generation to generation in this church till Jesus come. I read you a statement, so don't take that I there as Mr. Femi, no. And I told you here that I stand in the place of our very own beloved father in this mission, our very own Reverend Dr. Elijah Abena, the general overseer for this mission globally. So that I there stands for him. That I want us to continue to perpetuate from generation to generation in this church till Jesus comes. It states that to preach the word of God and bring people into membership of God's family. Let's say that together. To preach the word of God and bring people into membership of God's family. Let's repeat that again. To preach the word of God and bring people into membership of God's family. Let's say it again. To preach in the word of God and bring people into membership of God's family. Very good. Very good. Number two. To teach the word of God. To enhance freedom. Promote Christian maturity. And bind the people to God for service. Let's say that together. To teach the word of God. To enhance freedom. Promote Christian maturity. And bind people to God for service. Let's repeat it again. To teach the word of God. To enhance freedom. Promote Christian maturity. And bind the people to God for service. And the third component, to live the word of God, to demonstrate the new life in Christ to the world and ensure security of the believer. Let's stay together. To live the word of God, to demonstrate the new life in Christ to the world and ensure security of the believer. Let's repeat it again. To live the word of God, to demonstrate the new life in Christ to the world, and ensure the security of the believer. And one more time, let's go. To live the word of God, to demonstrate the new life in Christ to the world, and ensure the security of the believer. Also, let me remind you, me there standing for a general overseer, let me remind you of the five important core values that we must all continue to emphasize and embrace at home and abroad. I honestly want our churches to return to this foundational truth. As the man of God desires in his heart, so shall he be. Amen. 
So shall they be. The first one of our core values. And these are things that every member should know. These are things that every minister should know. If you stop me and you ask me, what are the core values of government or of House of Hope where you belong? We should know it. We should commit it to heart. And I challenge you, young generation that is coming behind us, your memories are much much sharper than mine and those of my generation. What you learn now, and I read you a few names when I started. These are wonderful people. Let me tell you this. These are individuals that I pray for the grace of God to help me continue to pray for. And you know why? I say it all the time. A time is coming. You will look on this end. You won't see Pastor Falayan there. He's gone. But there are those people who will continue to maintain the beauty of this ministry that the Lord has called us to. And you know why? It says that he that has called us have made us able ministers of the new covenant. We cannot fail. We cannot fail. And we will not fail in Jesus' name. So I want you to commit this to heart and understand it very, very well. You don't have to stand on this pulpit to be a minister. Those of us who get to stand here once in a while, we are privileged. Comes with that, come with that privilege uh, a sense of nervousness. <laughs> you think that each time Mr. Femi comes, well, they call me Pastor Falanya in this house. <laughs> Each time Mr. Femi comes on this pulpit, you think he's just so confident. and No, 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 no. There's an element of nervousness. Okay. <laughs> and one of the things we pray for is it's not my pulpit. It's yours, Lord. We're just your agent. Let's be your mouthpiece. Not what we want to say, but what you want to say. So number one, outreach, outreach, outreach. You know, you can learn our core values. You don't have to learn it in this specific order. Okay. In my mind, I go O-W-F-D-S. I use that acronym in my mind. If you ask me the first time, O-W-F-D-S. O stands for outreach. W stands for worship. F stands for fellowship. D stands for discipleship. S stands for service. That's, that's my personal secret. That's how I came to always, always remember it. Don't be in this house as just a nominal member. Be in this house first because you are a member of the body of Christ. And two, you are a member of the local assembly. House of Hope. You all know this is a great house. Hello? You all know this is a great house. Yes. Yes. Give him praise. Give it to him. Yes. Give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him. Okay. It's a great house. As a supporting pastor in this house, I know in my core, core of spirit that this is a house of covenant. What's the covenant? The covenant of hope is established upon this house. It's a congregation of the greats. It's a place where hope becomes manifestation. We don't just confess it. We believe it. We practice it. We stand for it. Amen? Amen. So the first one, outreach. We exist to preach the gospel to all mankind. Every service here should be a form of outreach. The message of our general overseer to us one of the ways it, 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 it came to reach to me personally is to come to say, hmm, 
every time you stand on this pulpit, there should be an opportunity for outreach. Every time you go out there and do what you do, remember, your value, part of your value is about outreach. Why? Turn to me to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. Okay, I'm just going to quickly read through verse 18 to 20. It says, and Jesus came. Sorry, Matthew chapter 28. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to give you a minute, a little bit to get to that. Matthew chapter 28. Oh, listen. Oh, listen. Oh, listen. Listen. Listen, I'm going to ask you a question. In Genesis, is Jesus represented there? Okay. So if I had said in Genesis and Jesus came, would I be wrong? Aha! It's all about him. It's all about him. He said to the Jewish leaders of his age, of his days, he said, before your father Abraham was, I am. Your fathers longed to see my days. So in that Genesis, he was there and he's still there. Yeah. Well, I don't mean to cover up my error. <laughs> Matthew 28, Matthew 28. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore. He was sending them, it's a command, and teach all nations. You know, interestingly, interestingly, he didn't just say and preach, but he says and teach all nations, baptizing them. That doesn't mean we don't preach. When we preach, we're still obeying the command. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And what are they to teach all nations? And what are we to teach all nations? Listen to 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Let's repeat that together. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And let's put it in a personal way. All things whatsoever he has commanded us. Yes. Amen. Amen. And Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So, outreach is an act of obedience to that commission, to that command, to that instruction. That we should go and teach people. But interestingly, you, you and I cannot teach anything that we have not been taught. Not only that we have not been taught, that we have not allowed ourselves to be taught. You know, there is a difference between something being available, something being there, and we tapping into that thing. It won't be because the teachings of Jesus are not there. They are there. If we have not been taught, it will only be because we have not made ourselves available for them. Do you understand that? It will only be for that reason. Or it was made available, but we defy it. There is a way that seems right to a man. You know, I once stood here and I remember one of the things I ministered here. 
that when a man is set up to destruction, if he or she formulates this idea within himself or herself, he or she turns away from people who can cancel him otherwise. The people that you surround yourself with, that you listen to, are the people who see it the same way that you see it. That deceit, that concept, that, that faulty ideology that you hold on to, so we got it so much, we think we are right in it. When anything is not exposed to the counsel of God, and we launch ourselves into it, very, very careful. Very, very careful. It will seem right to us. It seems right to us because we believe we cannot be wrong. We are not wrong. Nobody can tell me about this. There are individuals. I want you to listen to yourself. You are an individual that nobody can tell you anything otherwise. A million and one people can come to you. Nobody. Nobody. Not even a chance. Not even an opportunity. You block them off completely. Because you are set to do that thing that you think in your heart is the right thing. Be very careful. Be very careful. Be very, very careful. There is a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof is perdition. And you know one of the most deceitful things among human members? It's your heart. It says the heart of man Oh, don't even say it's wicked. It's very, very deceitful. And in Proverbs, it tells us, he said, God, that heart that is deceitful with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life, things that relate to life. So let's open ourselves up to teachings. To teachings of, of God's word. Let's submit ourselves to teaching of God's word. Is the first thing that will be in us before you can teach somebody else. You cannot teach anything that Jesus teaches if you don't understand and observe it. So the first call in that first outreach thing is you yourself. Submit yourself to the word. Number two, worship. We exist to celebrate God's presence. You know, everything we do is wash, it's an act of worship. When we sit together like this, we're in worship service. When you pray, you are worshiping. When you read the scriptures, you are worshiping. When you are teaching, go ye into all the world and you are teaching whatsoever you have learned in Christ. It's an act of worship. Excuse me, I'm going to move on quickly to the third one, which is the F. I told you O-W-F-D-S. That's my acronym to myself. You can take it if that will help you. You know, this brain is... Fellowship. We exist to incorporate people into God's family. Fellowship. You know, we used to listen to a radio program many years ago. And one of the things that the founders of that radio program teaches is that it's not necessary for you to belong to any local church. 
Once you are a believer, you are a member of the body of Christ. <laughs> I guess you could support any teaching with any part of the scriptures you want. Let's look at Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. Again, let me remind you, I'm not preaching a sermon. I'm casting a vision. I'm not engaging in discussion with you either. This is not a conversation. I'm delivering a message from the founding fathers of this mission or what our values are. Fellowship. Acts chapter 20. And I read verses 7 and 8. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, Let's say that together again. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together. The disciples did what? They did what? They came together. So, are we reading this from the Bible? Yes, we are. That will tell you something. You're sitting here now. It's not the first time the disciples will come together. We're following the acts of the believers that have gone before us, as it's written in the scriptures. Am I right about that? Yeah. When you read the letters of Paul to the Romans, the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the letter of Paul to the Philippians, to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, what do you think? You think it was just right into the town? Or to the cities? No. It was writing to churches. It was writing to the body of believers in Asia. In all of these little, little back then, their cities now, where he had gone ministering. So the idea of having a local assembly, the idea of the body of Christ coming together, is found in the very scriptures that we hold on to and believe. Somebody say amen. amen. So we believe in that fellowship. We value it. You don't, the, the rest you can read. I'm not so much about the rest of that uh, chapter. They are very important. So I want you to value it. The Lord valued it. Paul valued it. One of the things that is special about Paul, whew, looking back, if it had not been for Apostle Paul, the 12 disciples would have been blinded by the Jewish racial ethnicity. They would not have looked at the rest of us. The Lord used that man to break through that wall of old circumcision barrier of these people thinking we can monopolize God is for us. No. When that veil was open, I told somebody, I said, look, sometimes I wonder whether it's right for me to say that Abraham blessings are mine. It's not wrong. But a better blessing is mine. Amen. Jesus blessing are mine. Greater than Abraham is here. Amen. They can hold on to it because that's the covenant that God had with Abraham then with his generation. I'm not a Jewish person. You want to ask my nation? I'm a Yoruba nation person. But in Christ, whether you are a Yoruba nation or you are Indian, you're whatever, you have that covenant in him. Even if you cannot relate to Abraham, even if you are not circumcised, it's not circumcision of the flesh anymore, but circumcision of the heart. Number four, praise the Lord. Hallelujah discipleship 
discipleship. We exist to demonstrate God's family. And number five, service. I have to always remind myself that I'm delivering a message. Thank God one of the steps we are taking as we begin to come together again. Our mandate is to preach the word of God and bring people into the membership of God's family. We're also called to fellowship with one another, grow together as disciples of Christ, and do the work of the ministry as one body. We're also called to be shining lights to the rest of the world. These are clearly expressed in our core values as a church. And here are a few things I added. Thank God as we have started holding our services in the sanctuary now. I want to pause in that. I want you to give a shout of praise to the Lord that we are holding our services in the sanctuary now. We are holding our services in the sanctuary now. Being virtual only if that's the only choice you have. There's no reason unless for a reason best known to you, which, yes, you might be right with it. That might be the choice you have. Don't be complacent into that virtual mode that we've had for two years back now and take it as norm. Be here. So we've started holding service in the sanctuary for both children and adults. My very resident pastor of this house has announced to us I don't know if any of us remember that. Our intentional return to the transformational discipleship process, TDP. Are you all aware of that? Yes. Yeah. If you did not hear it, I'm letting you know now. Again, I don't stand here for myself. So in this face of it, I stand here on behalf of our resident pastor of this house. That made that announcement to us carefully that yes, we are set to return to the transformational disciple process, which is very, very key to some of these things. In it, we teach the foundational principles of our faith. It has to be taught. We have to make ourselves available for it. We teach about church membership, 001-101. We teach the elements of true discipleship, Christian maturity, and Christian service. If you have not been a part of it, remember, I told you I'm standing here to cast a vision. I'm standing here to declare a vision that is a covenant upon this house. Make yourself available for it. This aspect of the foundation for successful Christian living is so important that careful observation of it should be stressed in a generation where everyone feels sufficient and independent of others. What should be the relationship between a new convert and a local church, especially the one in which the convert is led to Christ. Some argue that once you are converted, you do not need to belong to any local church. You only belong to the church universal. Just be an an interdenominational man. This type of concept and practice has led many converts to the state of backsliding, apathy, and stagnancy. That's very, very unfortunate. 
I strongly advise that the young convert should belong to a Bible-believing local church that recognizes the Lordship of Christ. By a Bible-believing church, I mean the church that stands on the authority of the Word of God, that has the Word of God as a final court of appeal, and does not operate on man-made doctrine. The local church has a part to play in molding the life of the new convert, of the new convert. And the new convert also has its own duty to the church. I don't know how many of us have heard that statement before that Ajio is saying, when we believe, make yourself a part of a Bible-believing church. Let's think for a minute. Can I ever deliver a message, even though it's not mine, without engaging you? Ooh, let me engage you a little bit. Let me engage you a little bit. Let me engage you a little bit. Did you know that a new covenant, a new convert, does not have an idea what a Bible believing church is? That statement we make, that we should make yourself a part of a local church that is Bible-believing. When you are new, you can only identify what you know. If a person gets on that keyboard, if they are playing a wrong key, if you are not a musician with a sense of hearing for that key, you will not know whether the key is wrong or not. You might say, oh, fantastic. You wait and let brother Tim get here and listen to it. And I say, mm, no, no, no. They're like, give me B flat. <laughs> when he says, give me B flat, the rest of us might not know what exactly we're talking about. Here's my point to you. And let's not be mistaken about it. Believers who are coming to our presence new, they really don't know what the difference is from a Bible-believing church. Actually, to them, every church is Bible-believing. Every church is Bible-believing. What they see is a church. At least they are not worshiping Satan there. It's not a mosque. It's about the Bible. That's the way they feel. Let's, how do they identify a place as a Bible-believing church? Whew. Permit me, permit me of... Uh, Beloved General Overseer, I'm going to deviate a little bit. Yes, the pulpit, I understand that. Not only the pulpit, but the members. I say something today, and I say it many, many times. And I'm going to repeat it again. Today, not only in this house, not in government, among the Pentecostals and the Evangelicals in general, the sign of a believer, instead of it being the fruit of the Spirit today, he's speaking in tongues. I'm going to repeat that. Speaking in tongues have become the sign, what you would think is the sign of every believer. I'm very, very careful with what I'm, with what I'm telling you. Don't get me wrong. You can get into any house far above the fruit of the Spirit, far above love, far above endurance, far above forgiveness, far above long-suffering. Far above many things that we're told 
in the book of Galatians. The first thing you see, you know, I went to see a patient out there by the nature of my job. I, I do go out there to see a few people on a very, very small scale. And this is a lady that when I checked, oh, is under police monitor for criminal activities. So when I finished my clinical visit with her, I was about to leave and uh, for one reason or the other, and I said, can we pray? As I was about to pray for her, she busted out in speaking in tongues. I'm not laughing uh, uh, to tell you how decayed, how elevated speaking in tongues is. It doesn't matter sometimes what our lifestyle is. As a matter of fact, I say it sometimes. If you are, if you are new to an assembly, in a general congregation like this, and they call for prayer, you, you might think you are in a wrong place. Even if you want to pray, what is coming into your ears beside you, you can't even focus on the prayer for. And I've had a few believers come to me. Am I a believer, Mr. Femi? I said, why? Because I don't speak in tongues. I feel like I'm less than a believer. I said, no, you're not less than any believer. Just pray for it. Just pray for it. We seem to be out of control about it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not rebuking the spirit of God. I'm not rebuking that. The, you know, the spirit of the prophet is very, very subject to the prophet. I don't speak in tongues like I'm vomiting. No, I know. And I need to exercise some caution sometimes. Especially when there's a new person beside us here. I'm not talking about house of hope. I'm talking about what I observed. You can crucify me if I'm wrong about that. But so what we see more today, rather than the fruit of the spirit, those signs that can make people believe that, yes, these are people like Christ. They're no longer there as such. I watched on the TV the other day, and these ministers are speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and calling for African angels and African this. And I looked, and I just shook my head. That's how, I don't want to say how bad because this is the Holy Spirit. But this is how proliferated it has become. You wonder some of it that is actually the Holy Spirit. So I implore us, including myself, to do what we can to elevate the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the spirit that people come within us, like they look in Antioch and they say, these are believers. I did not read in the Bible that the Antioch Christians were called Christians because for every service, all over the place. No, because of the fruits that they demonstrated. Ah. Deacon Sunday or Malay. Deacon Otumba Murphy. Sister Olani. And a few of us. Actually, and all of us. Do you know what it will mean if you were to leave your spouse? Or to leave your spouses and you want to marry somebody else. <laughs> and nobody, nobody, nobody can talk to you about it. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you an example of what will happen. There's somebody who's a new believer out there who will say, uh, if if a money if I look at them, they are not together anymore. They are split. If brother Nisolani and his wife and his family, they are no longer together. So 
if Otomba Murphy, if Brad John Isaac, if many, if us ministers, um, listen, listen. That's the way. Let us rise up to our feet to pray. Let's rise up to our feet to pray. That's what that's what new come. That's what they see. That's what they see. And what they see is what they take as justification. If my very own resident pastor, Pastor Sunday Adu, and his wife are no longer together anymore, I tell you this. A lot of people out there can say, if it's wrong, if it's wrong, Pastor Adu will not have done it. It must have been the right thing to do. You don't have to be Pastor Adu. You don't have to be Deacon Murphy. You don't have to be Reverend Plummer. You don't have to be my former associate national overseer. Our lives, our lives are what tell new believers that this is a Bible-believing people. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for the impact of life. The intent is to declare the core values that you have established for us as a covenant in this house. We ask, O oh God, that in your mercy, in your mercy, you will establish these core values for us in government as a memorial and eternal covenant that as we speak of it today, that these values will become perpetual in our houses in the name of Jesus. In any of these areas where we are filthy, yes. If there's any of us here who is filthy and who is guilty, and who has transpired and who has failed to be an example in core values, particularly for new believers, who has failed to demonstrate the new life in Christ for believers, we ask for your mercies, O oh God. We ask for your healing, O oh God. We ask that what is being passed on by our leaders, by our founding fathers, that is meant to be a life covenant for government that you establish for us, you establish it for our children, you establish for our children, children. Government will never be nominal, will never be nominal. But government will always be as it was when it was given to our founding fathers and improved a brighter and a glorious church, just glorifying your name everywhere. Thank you, gracious God. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes, I receive.